Осторожно, двери закрываются. Следующая станция Боровицкая. The Grey Cardinal has left the building. Vladislav Surkov, architect of Russia's so-called sovereign democracy with its fake political parties, manufactured social movements, and feigned elections, announced his resignation this week. And Surkov's departure from the Kremlin came at a time when the Russian constitution is being overhauled with amendments to make Orthodox Christianity the official religion, to enshrine Russia's status as a victorious power in World War II, and to incorporate the office of a, quote, supreme leader. As Russia's political system is being redesigned to keep Vladimir Putin in power indefinitely, the regime's legitimization myth and its means of propagating that myth also appears to be in flux. Sovereign democracy appears to be out. The 19th century formula of orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationalism appears to be in. Hello from SEPA headquarters in Washington, D.C., and welcome to the Power Vertical Podcast. My name is Brian Whitmore, director of the Russia program here at SEPA. And joining me here in the studio is Leon Aron, a resident scholar and director of Russian studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Welcome back to the podcast, Leon. It's been too long. Pleasure. And also joining us in the studio is former U.S. State Department official and veteran Kremlin watcher Donald Jensen, a senior fellow and editor-in-chief here at SEPA and a lecturer at Johns Hopkins University. Welcome back, Don. Hello, my friends. Nice to be back. Nice to have you back. Leon, Leon, the last time we had you on, it has been far too long. It's been almost a year. Um, you, we, you and I had this fascinating discussion about, about ideology and the ideology of Putinism. And I think this is pretty relevant for our discussion today because even though Surkov has not really been involved directly in domestic politics for the past five years, he's had the Ukraine portfolio at the Kremlin, he really is the author of the Kabuki theater and the fake democracy that has legitimized the Putin regime until now. Uh, he, he was its original ideologist, and his system of so-called sovereign democracy endures pretty much to this day. And in this sense, I see Surkov's departure as almost symbolic um, of the end of the era where the Putin regime is even going to fake democracy anymore. The proposed amendments to the Constitution, and they are proposed amendments. These are not enshrined in the Constitution. They've not been voted on yet. Um, but they, they that were revealed this week, they seem to suggest the regime's moving in the direction of a quasi-theocracy. When you're talking about making orthodoxly the the, the religion of, of, of the official religion of Russia, you're in, in, enshrining the post of supreme leader in caps. And they, they, it's funny, the article in Letter Sky guys, they have to point it out that these are in caps. Uh, S, capital S, capital L, supreme world. Um, this, this tells us something. Would you agree, is the regime, do we, are we witnessing the regime changing how it's legitimizing itself? Uh, uh, absolutely. The, the, the long, uh, the short answer is that there is no need for Surkov's kind of Jesuitic <laughs> sophistication. We are now simpler. We are now closer to the pochva. We are now closer to the ground, to the soil. But you know what the, what this reminds me of is there's a there's an absolutely brilliant um, uh, recent book by uh, Professor Sergei Medvedev. Um, it's by the way for our listeners just been translated into English. Um, it's a collection of essays, and one phrase I remember and and he's I mean not only it's a it's a brilliantly written book but I mean the the and and and, and stylistically wonderful but he also has this. Uh, uh, wonderful power of, of, of looking into the future. And in one of the phrases, one of the passages in the book, he says, it's not, it's to interpret this, uh, we don't need Brzezinski and and Kissinger. We need uh, we need Berdyaev and Dostoevsky. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, I think, is what you're talking about. Uh, one other thing I remember uh, very presciently, uh, uh, the famous uh, Russian contemporary writer, um, Vladimir Sorokin said, and of course, this is all. This is all. This is all started. Um, uh, I would say in 2012, mm -hmm. but but certainly, yeah. but certainly, boiled up yes. in, in in 2014. The famous speech, um, yes. March 18, right? Post uh, uh, the incorporation of Crimea, and let me quote what what Vladimir Sorokin said: "The huge iceberg, Russia, frozen by the Putin regime, cracked after the events of Crimea. It has split from the European world and sailed off into the unknown. No one knows what will happen to the country now, into which seas or swamps mm. it will drift." And I think we are getting 
going into that swamp. Yeah, no, and I, I'm glad you mentioned Berdyaev. I think we also we need to look at Ivan Ilin oh. right now. Is is, is actually the the and Timothy Snyder makes uh, the Yale, the Yale University historian Timothy Snyder makes this case in 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 his most recent book about the importance of Ilin to Putin's thinking. Don, we've been discussing the mechanics of this change for the past couple of weeks. Me, you, and our colleague Maria Snegovaya have been talking about how, what kind of mechanics are they gonna put in place to keep Putin in power? What we haven't talked about really in depth until now is the how, they, how are they gonna legitimize this? Because Surkovism, right, uh, the, the, the sovereign democracy concept was kind of useful when Russia was pretending to be a democracy. They're not pretending anymore. And I couldn't help but remember a year, about around a year ago, you and I did a, a program about a very controversial article that Sorokov wrote for Nezavisa Magazeta titled The Long State of Putin. It's taped in my um, bathroom the, wall. Yeah. <laughs> well, the piece basically had three points and now they look almost prophetic. This looks almost like a blueprint. He says, is point one, democracy is an illusion in the Western society. In Western societies, it only works because people believe in the illusion they have choice. Putin's created a better system and one that can rule Russia for 100 years it, uh, it, because it understands the algorithms of the Russian people. I think this is fascinating. Um, and he calls Putin's Russia the fourth manifestation of the Russian state after Ivan III, Peter I, and Lenin. Um, I would replace Lenin with Stalin there, actually. I would, I would make that. Putinism, with its stress on sovereignty, populism, traditionalism, and patrimony, is the ideology of the future and will challenge li liberal democracy for primacy. So as Surkov is leaving the scene, it almost looks like something he wrote a year ago was a blueprint for the post Sirkovian system that, that that is developing, or am I am I barking up the wrong tree here? No, I'm, I'm humbled by being around guys who read Berger more than I do. Uh, <laughs> a couple of points. First of all, I think the discussion a year ago, gentlemen, was about whether this was to be taken seriously, right, or a post hat hawk kind of. Right, with Surkov just trolling us. A rather crude set of power relationships. And I think I'm not convinced that this is a blueprint or prophetic, except that this is something he wrote, and I find him a very fascinating combination of charlatan and operator. There's something he wrote post facto. I didn't take it all that seriously then, but he does have a relatively plausible, if not believable, blueprint superimposed. Uh, on this, uh, Brian, I, I just have trouble. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the more important point for me is this issue of are we leaving sovereign democracy, which was neither fully sovereign nor democratic. Right. I think that that fig leaf played a role, unconvincing as it was, in legitimating the system to some Russians. Mm -hmm. I think the problem for me here in both. The, prof with the prophetic nature of what you just said and the whole abandonment allegedly of sovereign democracy is that there are a lot of Russians who simply don't buy it. And mm. I think thus you get into what I think, where I think you're going, which is a, a should I say, crisis of legitimacy for the system. Well, I, what, we this is what I want to drill last into. Week and I don't want to jump the point. So this to me is, is um, Surkov, this being the article you mentioned, uh, uh, written in a bar someplace with his friends. To some extent, it's true. To some extent, it rationalizes post facto what already is happening. So I'm not sure how much the details should be taken very seriously. As I said last week, the tension between the formal guarantees of democracy and constitutionalism are at war with this. And I think, as I've said last week, this creates a tension in the system that I don't care how many guys in top try to redesign is going to cause problems down the road. That's what I would say. Uh, I would I would certainly agree with that. And, and we I can think, wait. And, and we, we can, can wait. We'll cross and that bridge at some point week, in the future. But we're already seeing the problems. But you're touching on something I want to get into here. Sure. And this is, I mean, all the dramaturgy, all the kabuki theater, all the fake fakeness of the political the system that, that, that mimicked democracy. Um, it did serve a purpose. It legitimized yes, the regime. Yes. And I was wondering when we were going to get to the point where they're going to say, do we even need to bother having elections anymore? And I think we're getting close to that point. And the question remains, 
then what is the legitimizing myth? The Soviet yeah. Union had a legitimizing myth. It was Marxism, Leninism, it was communism, and that yeah. was the that was that was why. By the way, it also <laughs> seduced a number of Western pe- scholars, none of whom are in the studio, about Russia's yes. institutional viability. Well, and as Putin, this Putin thing. is also seducing some Western scholars as, as well. Um, but are we at that point? I mean, for Leon, actually, to to the Sirkov articles, was it a prophetic? Was it a blueprint? And are we moving to a point where? And how do you how do you legitimize yourself without a well, as, as, as you probably remember, I, I think I touched on this. It's it's been a bee in my bonnet for a couple <laughs> of years. Um, this is exactly. I mean, Surkov aside, you know, deep state aside, as he called it, um, you know, following we know who, um, the how to legitimize what the Russian scholars and observers called problem twenty four. Mm. <laughs> now, so so to paraphrase Anna Akhmatova. Putin, you got to give it to him. He starts always with vegetarian options, right. you know. <laughs> so, so, so he always starts with the vegetarian options. You know, if they don't work, you move closer to carnivores, right? right. But, but vegetarian. So this is a vegetarian. What, we, what, what we saw now, what we saw now, Brian. Contrary to what some of our colleagues were fulminating about, is not a sweeping change of the constitution. You know, I, I think I, I think Tatiana Stanovaya and, and others, and I actually what 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 I found very interesting is, and I'll get to mm-hmm. the legitimation mm-hmm. in, in a moment, is that I still have my copy of the Yeltsin Constitution on my shelf, bought in December of 1993 uh-huh. in Moscow. I opened it, and the, the parliament did have the power not to approve the prime minister yes, and then three remember three times three and you're times out and, then yeah. and you're yeah. out so the difference is between согласование which mm-hmm. is you know i don't know consent, g- consent and утверждение right <laughs> i mean <laughs> this Affirmation, you right. need you need a linguistic microscope to right. to see the difference right so that's not the issue this is the first step at problem 24 i don't think it's going to work I think people will yawn. There'll be a bunch of sarcasm. I should go go back and 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 update my my anecdote or right. article. Um, so what's next? This is what bothers me, and I think you and I touched on this. Right. So there is Belarus. Right. Um, there is, of course, Ukraine. Um, there is perhaps you know northern provinces of Kazakhstan. Mm-hmm. And of course, the thing that bothers me the most um, is poking at the eastern flank of NATO, the, the yeah. Baltics. Um, I hope I'm wrong, mm-hmm. but Putin is out of risk-free options mm. for 2024. Now, there is, of course, th- th- there are two polar options that he can choose. One is follow Kudrin, uh, Alexei Kudrin, the famous no, you know, economist, liberal. And um, reform himself reform, out of a job. And reform mm. himself out of a job, which he's not going to do. Right. On the opposite end, just turn it into, you know, North Korea. In which case, it doesn't matter what people think. It, legitimation stops to exist because terror takes care of all of this. Now, that is, it, it's possible, mm. but there are serious doubts about this, whether it's in his character and whether he's willing to roll that dice. And isn't there a, a stop short of the North Korea yes, option, which yes, is, is which does have an ideological justification for a completely authoritarian well, of course, state of with course. no elections? No, I mean, his friend, he's, he's looking at his friend Xi Jinping, mm-hmm. uh, um, admiring him greatly. It's apparently it's mutual. Um, and, and I think she y- fakes it. I think it's true. I'm putting <laughs> <side>. <laughs> and, and the question is whether you're right. He doesn't have to go all the way to North Korea. There's there's China. There's Iran. Right. Um, Iran, I think, is the most relevant right. example. But the point, which, by the way, also has elections, mm-hmm. uh, yes. Uh, yes. but also has a supreme leader. Right. Um, so the question is how far. In other words, I think. You know, letting Surkov go, going through these amendments, creating, you know, like you said, the trifecta of Pravoslavia, Samodirzhavia, and Narodnis, that is not going to do it. And what what I think should worry us is what's next. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you you mentioned uh, problem twenty four, Leon, I, and I agree with you. I, but I think problem twenty four is a the current contemporary symptom of a much much deeper problem in Russia, and that is the lack of a succession principle. And this is something Don and I we've touched on, oh, you know, in, in passing. But they they've never been able to ever square that circle. Right. And when a regime doesn't have a a succession principle, it has to rely. And again, I'm citing Professor Snyder, what he calls the politics of eternity. 
<laughs> this this search for this innocent past when we have when we when we were pure and we've always been victimized by outsiders. You have to vilify outsiders, and this is what worries me about where we might be going because I think this is something that is almost in the DNA that causes Russia to be a revisionist power. It's one of the things, and until it gets over the succession the succession problem, and I don't see any way no. out of this. No. They're going. They're 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 go, they're going to be. They're, they're going to be as Russia has been only more so. Well, um, uh, just just one mm. bit before done. But before done, just one one comment. Uh, it, it, Putin is not thinking about succession. Putin is thinking about surviving mm. and dying in office uh, for as long as it takes him. That's all. I, I'm cons- I'm not at right. all convinced that he is turning and tossing at night thinking of succession. Right. There is no succession. Yeah. So long as he lives, there is no succession. And he's only in his 60s. Of um, course. Um, and and he s- appears to be healthy. Yeah, um, hockey. Right. Uh, uh, and his team, believe it or not, always wins. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Don, you want to jump? Might sound strange to no, you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess the upside would be that the Roman Empire had no succession principle either, and <laughs> Augustus lasted a long time. But uh, I agree with Leon very much that that this is about staying in power, and thus the the uh, some of the debates of the past couple of weeks about the nuances of this or this state organization uh, sort of are, are kind of useless. Can I get back, Brian, to yeah. this issue of orthodoxy, the Supreme Court? This is where I, this is one place I wanted to go. Uh, good. Well, that's. Uh, I think each of those, as a revived basis for the regime, have serious flaws in the Russia of 2021. Orthodoxy, you know, we've heard the expression uh, orthodox atheist. I think <laughs> right. this doesn't mean anything to no, most Russians. No. Uh, the World War II thing, yes. I like the word Which fetish. is the nationalism. Yes. Yeah, it's, that's the, na- the what nationalism. What is nationalism? It, it worked for a while in Ukraine, but can you revive it without taking these risks that Leon mentioned? And third, uh, autocracy, that's, I think, the most compelling. But each of these has a problem, and I return back to the problem over the, sh- the issue, the challenge, that there is a legitimacy problem facing the regime, especially if Putin steps aside to yeah. something else. I had forgotten about the Iranian elections, Leon. You're absolutely right. Well, These no, this do is, make a difference. This is something I wanted to wanted to get at. Russia is not North Korea. One thing I could see happening is having this Iranian-style system where you have elections and presidents come and go, parliaments come and go, but there's a supreme leader who has the final say over everything. Probably Those as a chairman of state council. Yeah, that, that, exactly. That, that that's seemed, what, that's yeah. the mechanics yeah. of how I think some combination of that in the Security and of course, Council, uh, recalling thinking. Deng Xiaoping, yeah, giving up all the titles except for the chairman of the military commission, right? And of course, Nazarbayev followed right. all those steps. Maybe this is what we're seeing here. We can see that, and the, the, then the question is: Well, why does Putin get to be in? Ch- I mean, you, the, this is what. How do you legitimize that? The 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 elections will re- legitimize the system as a whole, but why does Putin get to be that? Now, the reason he's that, I think, is because he is a broker among the clans. He is the one figure that all the clans trust and the clans all hate each other. Right. And so Putin can be the honest broker. I hate using that adjective <laughs> honest and, and applying it to Putin's name. But in this case, I guess an I can. Effective broker. <laughs> effective broker. That's a good um, that that's fine for the elite. But for the population, that's not fine. And you have, one has to wonder how how this is going to play out in practice in Russia. But Brian, Brian. Uh, 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 six year in a row falling or stagnant incomes. Yeah. The, 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 there was a clash. There was a, a, a sort of a bang of of of, of brass. Uh, a, a last uh, maybe they'll have a growth of 0.8 percent this year. Boy, that's a triumph. Right. Before that. Last year it was 0.1 percent. How do you even? It's is it is it like this? Maybe a, just a, a rounding error. But before that, for five years from 2014, uh, incomes falling. The growth last 10 years on average is one percent. Mm-hmm. Putin, uh, excuse me, Kudrin. Uh, God knows how long he's allowed to say this. But again, at at the um, Congress of Grashdansky Initiative, mm-hmm. he again said, you know, without the reform, and he's been saying it since 2012, without the reform, regardless of the price of oil, we're looking right. at no growth or stagnation and perhaps a recession. All of this, Brian, to say that it's not just a problem of legitimacy. Uh, you, you can have that problem when you grow 
like right. in his first two terms, uh, seven, eight percent a year in terms of incomes, right? People, uh, uh, Kudrin always talks about poverty. You all saw those yeah. numbers. Yeah. Uh, uh, half of the Russian families cannot afford the second pair of shoes. You know, this is not the time. Right. To 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 get go high, well, highfalutin. Could we go into a protracted? I mean, the standards of living during the Bre the late Brezhnev period, as you well know, were not great. But yet that regime survived. Um, or are these Russians different? than the Soviet citizens of those days that were, were, were didn't know anything better, so were willing to accept it. Are, are these Russians different due to Russia's integration into the global economy? It's, it's, certainly, it's certainly not as easy as in the right. Soviet Union. Not as easy. Of course, you can, you know, there, there, there are projects to uh, uh, shut down the internet, follow the Chinese model, Iranian model. I think the, the bacillus is there, the virus is there. Enough people traveled. Yeah. Um, in other. fact, that was a strategy to reserve, uh, to release pressure on the regime. That's true, that too. Was a conscious strategy. Strategy. Get out. Yeah. Yes, yeah. get out. But it's just, Brian, this, this you know, the, the, the state of the economy is such, and the people tell pollsters that they hate everybody in the mm. government from their mayor <laughs> all the way to ministers and prime minister of whom he just got rid of. And Putin used to be able to. Right. Well, he is hovering. He's hovering, but it's touching him now. It's yeah, touching him. Yes. The hovering rather dangerously 60 plus percent. Which is which not enough for a system like yes, this. No. <laughs> so, so again, the question is, you know, we tend to, you know, there's a fancy term path dependence. Right. I mean, we tend to repeat what worked before. Right. Early 2014, he was at the lowest rating, then there was Crimea. Well, it Ukraine. is interesting that Belarus has kind of gone off the, the radar screen, which makes me nervous because yeah. when things go off the radar <laughs> screen, that's when you got to keep an eye on them. Um, but um, Don, you want to yeah, just say just one something. more point about Putin's authority. Uh, somebody probably listening to this broadcast wrote an article a couple of years ago about the, uh, what was the phrase, the, the sacredness, sacramentalism of power. Yeah. Which is goes sacralization to, of power. Sacralization, sacralization of power, yeah. and I forgot who wrote it. Yeah, uh, but it goes to the personal authority of Putin that comes from an interrelationship with the society, and a lot of these schemes will cut that. And remember. Yeah. Uh, Leon's too young to remember that in the 90s, Yeltsin's popularity went from about 7, 67 to 5 in months. Yeah. And then when he became infirm, this some variant of this could well happen again if Putin is not in the public light as the leader. And I just don't know. And I do not think path dependent. We yeah. brought that up. Yeah. Necessarily, things will continue as they no, have. In a it's lot a of ways, we're, situation. we are situation. moving into uncharted territory yeah, right now. Absolutely. I mean, it's like we, we, you know, Russia watchers always kind of draw on our past experiences yeah. and things we know and how it worked before. But we are, in, in a lot of ways, you are seeing some things repeat themselves. This problem with the succession principle, the need for legitimizing myth, um, the, 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 the need to use foreign adventure to, yeah. to, to, well, to justify well, domestic right. rule. There's a, there's a brilliant article by um, uh, Kirill Rogov yeah. um, where he said Putin always had two functions that made him popular. One, he was a redistributor and a guardian of wealth. That's primarily during first two terms. Right. Then he became the defender of the nation. Mm -hmm. The defender of the nation and the restorer of the empire of the glory. Yeah. Right. That is why he, while the government is at thirty percent, uh, he's at sixty. Th that has been a shield. Mm -hmm. And again, going back to my concern, you know, you you, you get on that tiger. Uh, of, of patriotic mobilization, but the tiger, it's a wonderful mode of transportation, but it requires meat for fuel. Right, and I mean, Peter Pomerantsev has made the point that it's this regime doesn't, it runs on passive acquiescence. And the, the paradox here is when you base a legitimacy on on that on this this rabid nationalism, it's a little too hot for the system to <laughs> handle. And it's a, it, it's a good point. I wanted to also go back to your point about the economy, which I think is this actually touches on something pretty important. It's this paradox of modernization that Russia has always had. In order to develop this economy, you have to diversify and decentralize it, right? That's the only way to do it. But once you do that, you diversify and decentralize political power, and that's unacceptable. So what is necessary economically is politically unacceptable, and there's no way out of that, really. I mean, th this is why you wouldn't follow the, the Kudrin model. Don, did you? Did now, you so who's to, in 2028 or something, who's to stop... 
whoever's the nominal prime minister, the president then, saying, who is this old guy here in the corner? Well, it depends Nothing. if it's the not Siliviki Iran, not answer China. to him. It depends if the Siliviki answer to him. Well, yes, and it's yes. also, and it's also uh, 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 depends on uh, something that, that Brian touched on. Um, you know, there's, there's. I think there's a part in somewhere in Gorbachev's memoirs, or maybe it's just a, a sort of the swirling, you know, folklore. But he writes about how he, you know, he came to um, uh, uh, Moscow, and he was this gung ho former Komsomol leader, you know, a believer in communism, and he he talked to uh, Andropov, and Andropov told him two things. First, he said, we really shouldn't get together too often because Leonid Ilyich already knows that we're getting together and he's getting suspicious. And secondly, he did not say it in those words, but he implied, you know, we know what Brezhnev is, right? But, but he is the cement. Right. He is what holding this together. In retrospect, he was right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure. I mean, Don may be right, but but I, he, so long as he's a symbol, right. so long as 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 like you said, he holds the he is arbitraging between right. the between the clans, um, and and also you know historically, Brian, I was looking at things. Um, can you tell me, can you give me an example of an authoritarian leader who is deposed after 20 plus years? After five, yes. After 10, yes. <laughs> I mean, barring foreign, foreign invasion, mm -hmm. barring, because whatever he is, he's a linchpin of the system. And I think that's, that's where he, but that, however, is a different story. Now I'm yeah. looking at the elites. That does not mean that at some point, somewhere in Shias or somewhere, there's a garbage strike. Right. And, and it just, you remember, remember Pushkin, Ruski Bund, Bismyslen, Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, I mean, like, I, this will legitimize him among the elites. Uh, the where, where I think he's going to run into problems is not with the elites. No, it's going to no, be in no, with, 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 with in, in, in society, yep. in 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 general. Um, we also want to talk a bit about Surkov's other role, which was Ukraine, which is actually an interesting concept because I always have seen hybrid war is kind of international Surkovism, and. Um, the you know this use of again kabuki theater fake drama the whole ruski mir concept the way the whole ukraine operation to, uh, was was conducted to me was very Serkovian in a lot of ways and it's not just an accident it was so theatrical yeah. right and and uh, and uh, this is what i want to get into in okay. in the second half is talk a little bit about or does this does Serkov's move out now spell a change in ukraine so i guess in a it's a good way to segue in a few moments we will continue our discussion and look at whether Serkov's departure indicates a change in ukraine policy i would like to remind you you are listening to the power vertical podcast my name is brian whitmore director of the russia program here at sepa joining me here in the studio is leon arone a resident a resident scholar and director of Russian studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Also with us in the studio is former U.S. State Department official and veteran Kremlin watcher Donald Jensen, a senior fellow and editor-in-chief here at CEPA and a lecturer at Johns Hopkins University. I'd also like to remind you, you could subscribe to the Power Vertical podcast on iTunes. You can read the Power Vertical blog and watch the vertical video at CEPA.org, and you can follow us on the Twitter at Power Vertical. Now, one place where Surkov's departure made a lot of news is, of course, Ukraine. And that's because Ukraine has been his main portfolio as an aide to Putin since 2013, which it just so happens to be the time when the Russian aggression in Ukraine started. Um, there's been a lot of speculation out there that Dmitry Kozak taking over the Kremlin's Ukraine portfolio will lead to a policy change. Ilya Panamarov, the only member of the Duma who voted against the Crimea annexation, who is now living in exile in Kiev suggested this and it suggested that it indicates that maybe Putin's going to give up on Donbass, which I don't buy for a minute. Um, Anders Asland at the, at the Atlantic Council also had a piece suggesting we're, we're going to see a policy change. Personally, I'm not convinced. Uh, Putin's goals in Ukraine remain the same. Um, and and they, they are incapable of changing. I think the strategic goal is incapable of changing. And changing Surkov for Kozak, 
I think just represents a change in tactics. I mean, Surkov, let's face it, he's something of a showboat who's all about illusion and subterfuge. Kozak, and I knew I knew Dmitry Kozak during my time in Petersburg, he is something entirely different. He is a workaholic, chain-smoking laser beam of a man. <laughs> right? um, and he is, he's Putin's Mr. Fix-It. The Olympics. Cool. Yeah, the Olympics. I mean, try to arrange Winter Olympics in the subtropics. <laughs> next, next, next to the bunch of terrorists in the Caucasus. Right. Mm-hmm. He did it. He did, he did it. it. Yeah. No, he is Mr. Fix-It. When he's the guy Putin puts on a problem when he wants it seriously solved. Now, what does this pretend, Don? We Well, I have a number. Uh, this has been a very interesting week for Ukraine watchers as well. I just want to make two points before I answer your question. Number one, especially the Medusa article we've talked about this week, you see at long last something that a lot of us who follow Ukraine closely have known for a while. He was not the only guy in charge right. of the Ukraine policy for the past couple of years. There were other actors as well, including Kozak. And this right. You look at it carefully. It tells us a lot about Kremlin decision making and how Putin handles things. In fact, I know there were Silaviki directly liaising, as they say in that awful word, <laughs> with Donbass commanders in 2014 around Surkov and Putin. So we see a messier yes. dis- management situation uh, than a lot of people have thought. Number two is that Ukraine, uh, the Kremlin's management of Ukraine has changed substantially from the No Russia. Mm-hmm. in March of 2014 to what is quite a bit different now. And to me, this also speaks about the limits of hybrid warfare, that given a stout Ukrainian resistance, given Western aid, the, the Kremlin had to pull back its really ambitious goals and thus re- resort to something other than hybrid warfare to manage the system. The, the two points I wanted to make. Mm-hmm. But to answer your question directly, I do think... It reflects probably a, a, a change in the Kremlin tactics, but certainly not, not in strategy. strategical. I absolutely agree. But what that means, I'm not sure yet. Something I rarely say on this broadcast. I mean, I have whether it's, some... whether it's Whether it's giving the Donbass back, I doubt it. Uh, I on think, Moscow's terms, they do want to give it back. Uh, but As a Trojan horse, yes, they yeah, do want exactly, to give it back. Exactly, exactly. Right. I do think they are playing games or trying to, especially last summer with Zelensky. I mean, and, I've and, heard and, a couple of and, things. And we'll see. And I'm, It's not worked. He's sort of grown into the office a little bit. Uh, so I do expect changes in Moscow's approach to the system, the Macron flirtation, all that kind of thing, I think does reflect a change of Kremlin's tactics, you called it. Probably, yeah. I mean, probably. What that means over the long term, and I, I agree with you that it's not really going to be an abandonment of their goals for Ukraine. I mean, according to my reading of the Russian press, the, the, the most plausible explanation for Surkov leaving was Ukraine, effectively, that he failed in Ukraine, and that the, the, it was became painfully evident that he failed in the Normandy format meeting between Putin and Zelensky, where surprisingly, yeah. I thought P- P- Zelensky ate Putin's lunch. And it was, I guess this was seen where, where Surkov's kabuki theater subterfuge showboat tactics, which are, in a, you know, in a lot of ways, all hat and no cattle, just aren't going to cut it. And you needed somebody like, like like Kozak in there. Now, Kozak has a little bit of experience in situations like this. Remember the Kozak Moldova. plan? Moldova. The Kozak plan for Moldova, which was a non-starter as far as the Moldovans were concerned. But it's it's out there and it hasn't. It's like Freddy Krueger. The thing just doesn't die. And I, I'm, I'm expecting to see a Kozak plan for the Donbass, which looks very similar to the Kozak plan for Transnistria, and it's basically going to be what Moscow's strategic goal has always been there, and that is for this federalization of Ukraine with the Donbass, with the occupied parts of the Donbass reintegrated with these, these like, special rights as a region that would, would basically create a dysfunctional Ukraine. Mm-hmm. I mean, it would effectively create exactly. a dysfunctional, it would turn Ukraine into Bosnia-Herzegovina. Exactly, exactly. And that's where I think, now this is nothing, there's nothing new under the sun. Right. This has been Moscow's goal since they gave up on the Novorossiya project, yeah. right? Because I always thought plan A was Novorossiya. When that failed, plan B became this Trojan horse plan, which is a, which is basically the Kazakh plan. Leon, I wanted, I wanted to hear you. You were also a close observer of Ukraine. What do you? How do you? See? Well, I I, I wrote. I, I found I found a lot of. I mean, Don touched on this. I, I wrote a piece about w- w- why nothing happened in Paris on December 9th, <laughs> right. which is a fascinating question because on the one hand, there was 
I'm sure there was quite a pressure on Zelensky, uh, certainly by Macron, maybe even by... Uh, I heard not by Merkel. I heard by not, Macron, by but Macron. not by Merkel. Yeah, That's by what Merkel. I heard. On the other hand, there must have been some pressure on Putin, the dangling of the end of sanctions or scaling down. and I th- But I think um, everything ended as it should have. Right. Uh, Zelensky does not want to be lynched. Right. Um, <laughs> and Putin... Uh, well, he he will not be lynched, uh, but but he cannot say, "Oops, we made a mistake." Right? He cannot. He cannot. This is this is whether the Navarrosia concept is out. Nobody remembers it. He cannot go back to the Russian people and say, "Okay, it was a mistake. We're we're you know we're we're making peace with Ukraine and Donbas. You know we're disarming the Donbas." The remember the the sequence: elections first, the mm-hmm. disarmament first. I, I was surprised. In I was border. surprised that Putin did. I mean that that Zelensky did not give in, but neither did neither did Putin. Mm-hmm. So so so, as you both said, and and I just would like to spell out, a a a, a stable, um, uh, pro Western Ukraine is unacceptable to Putin. Right. Period. Unacceptable. Either it has to be not pro Western, which which means a different regime, or it has to be unstable. Right. And and that's why you need Donbass. Uh, it, he will never give it up. It's funny, we all talk about Trojan horse, except we know what's inside the horse. Right, right. <laughs> which the Trojans did not know. Right, right. right. Uh, <laughs> uh, much to their chagrin. Um, so, so I agree with both of you. Strategically, nothing changed. Kazakh may, he's a technar, he's a technologist. He may, he may uh, start feeding Zelensky, um, um, you know, some sort of um, partial solutions or, mm. or something that looks, um, you know. I think he also, frankly, has a bit more uh, integrity than, I mean, nobody trusts Sorkov. Right, I don't think right. even Putin trusts Sorkov. And, but, but I think Kozak does have, you know, a personal integrity that, that I think might help him a little bit here. Um, no, I can, I mean, I can, again, from my time in Petersburg and knowing Kozak when he was working for Subcheck, and he's a nice guy. Yeah. He comes across as a, he's a really good guy. Yeah. yeah. And he, so, but he's, he's serving, he's serving Putin. Yeah. <laughs> right. And he, is, right. and he is, this is, Kozak, you want, you want a job done, give it to Dima. Right. This is how and it that always may be was. One of the this major. was how it was in the Petersburg local yeah. government, yeah. and this is how it was in, 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 in the federal. Government. So you know, he's going to be better able to tie in the men, tie up some of the many loose ends. Maybe, many, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe tidy up. To, I think is yeah, is they. Yeah. But that's you know what's tidy. But the end, the <laughs> end, the end product here is going to be some variant of the Cossack plan in Moldova, and that's going to be unacceptable for the Ukrainians. Yeah. Um, and Ukraine's not going to not be pro-Western. That society, I think, has made its choice. Full well, stop. L- game over. Largely, largely thanks to Putin. Thanks, thanks to, Putin. to Putin. He exactly. formed the, yeah, the yeah. Kara. He formed the modern Ukrainian he was nation. The, he was yes. the midwife of well the modern Ukrainian Well done, Vladimir. Yeah, yeah. Well done. And, it's a, and again, we had we had Oleg Sensov here uh, speaking at SIPA this week. And it's, you know, a, a Russian speaker. And he's as Russian as they come from, 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 uh, the, from Crimea. And he is the biggest Ukrainian patriot you're ever going to... Ever, ever, ever going to meet? This is what's happened. People like that have become Ukrainian patriots, and so that's the, 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 this is. I don't see any way out of this. And actually, to circle back and kind of bring the the, the themes of the both sides of the podcast together, Ukraine is very important for Putin regime, the Putin regime's domestic legitimacy. Of course. And so this is again, this is the, these two things are not unrelated to each of other. Sure. And you one has to wonder sure. where this goes now. Yeah. Where does this go? I mean, I, 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 I don't. The whole situation, right? You have a Ukrainian situation where you have a Ukrainian society that has made its choice, is going pro Western, unacceptable to Putin. No way to stop that other than an all out war on Ukraine. And even and that, even that might not stop it. Even that might not stop it. Um, and you have this type, you have a regime that is changing its mode of legitimizing itself, moving away from the kabuki theater of fake elections into God knows what, right? Orthodoxy, nationalism, and, 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 um, and autocracy. And militarism. And militarism. Um, you know, it's going to have a supreme leader that, you know, okay, why does he get to be the supreme leader? What gives him that legitimacy? Are we? Is it a theocracy? But Ukraine is a big part of that. Yep. And Russia without Ukraine... Yep. Yep. It, this regime cannot be legitimate. Yep. Yep. Legitimized well, that way. you know, you know, uh, Ukraine is is Russia's Algeria. Uh, uh, how many assassination attempts uh, uh, the goal survived? Two, right. three, four. Yeah. Um, 
but he has you know certain manly parts and 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 it worked um now putin is not going to take this risk no way no way he's uh, it, 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 giving giving up on donbass means a huge blow to his legitimacy and remember his legitimacy is we are protecting the russians everywhere they live um and ukraine is one but there there are quite a few of them in latvia and estonia as well and that's part of his problem he can't really go forward in ukraine and he can't go back correct yeah. correct i mean another thing i'm keeping an eye on and you know, one has to wonder if you can't solve this problem of the donbass if Ukraine's not going to take it back as a Trojan horse and Putin's not going to give it back not as a Trojan horse, Correct. what do you do with it? Do you freeze it forever? You basically, do you, do you, do you freeze it forever? Do you recognize it? They eventually did that with with the Skingvali region, Sabkazi yeah. and the Skingvali region. Yeah. I refuse to call it South Ossetia <laughs> because the, the Georgians call it I think we're a long region. way from that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Transnistria, I mean, I, th this, this is the new Russian empire, if you will. It's 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 Russia, the Skingvali region, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, the LNR and the DNR. That's the new Russian Empire. Um, <laughs> do you do, do you do you formalize that? And the thing is, I don't think that's the worst thing that would ever happen to Ukraine. This is heresy in, in Kiev, and I might get pilloried by my Ukrainian friends for this, <laughs> but a reasonable argument can be made that let's just move forward with the the, the and you, you never give up your formal claim to that territory, right? right. Uh, just like you never give up your formal claim to to Crimea, yep. just like the Baltic states never gave up their 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 formal claim to independence, yep. but let's just you you move you move forward with with, with the with, I, with I the think rest de facto it's happening. Um, uh, the, the, remember Zelensky, from what I recall, never said I will return Donbas to us. I he said I will end the war. Right. So that's true. So that's true. so the question is the question is but but if 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 Putin literally ends the war then your scenario will you know will de facto bypass Ukraine will bypass uh right. Donbass and continue to move west that is not going to work yes and that and, and, that and that is that, not acceptable to Putin that's not acceptable to Putin I mean they could try a distraction in Belarus which is problematic in it for its own reasons well um, if they need to either kill Batka or or, right. or I don't think they can even buy him because They're at not, this point he's not for sale no no uh, he's 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 playing his we own game. We should talk very about effect. Belarus in one of our podcasts. No, I, yeah. I, I I I would I would definitely <laughs> be before that, and we've done a couple of them. But I oh, would, yeah? would, would 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 certainly do it in the future, and would love to have you on to, to to do that. In fact, I I testified on the Hill at the Helsinki Commission on well, Belarus uh, la, la, last month, and it's a it's an interesting intractable <laughs> problem for the West because. <laughs> Lukashenko is never going to be our friend, right, right? But yet we have to figure out a way to protect Belarusian sovereignty. Absolutely. Without you know, it's 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 a really tricky paradox, yeah. and it's a paradox for the Russians because of course. they can they control the transition if they get rid of him, I, probably. But it's not a hundred percent guaranteed. Um, so it's a it's a it's a real. Do they want to expand the the human and and, and what do you do, do you do do you do a, a Afghanistan December nineteen seventy nine with taking over the Amin, Amin Palace and killing right. the leader? That's not, I mean, you know, uh, the times you know, changed and Belarus is not Afghanistan. Yeah, and if you follow like the Nezigar Telegram channel, there was all this talk about the, the plans are already on the books. They were gonna create the new USSR, the Union of Sovereign Slavic States, oh. right? Um, so, and I don't think that, that just because nobody's talking about no. it right now, it doesn't mean it's not on the books. I think a lot of, I think there are lots of options um, before Putin. He he's systematic. He is orderly. He works on all of them. Mm -hmm. I think at, at the same time, and then he'll. I think he'll see. I don't think he he made the again going back to the main theme, Brian that um, that you outlined. I don't think he settled on one key legitimizing point. No, all kinds of things are in the works. Well, it's funny in a lot of ways. This this mirrors the the mechanics that Don and I have been discussing on the podcast for the past couple of weeks. It it might be the state council that he that he uses to stay in power. It might be the security council that he uses to stay in power. It might be some combination of the two. Um, it's, so he's kind of keeping his options open. 
in distributing power among various different power centers. I don't don't did not buy the initial interpretation. This was strengthening the Duma. I thought that was complete well, nonsense. But it was uh, strengthening the but it was strengthening the Fed Council. Yeah, it was strengthening yeah. the Fed Council. Yeah. and that so I think there and just just as is the case with the mechanics, the legitimizing ideology. There seems to be a lot of items on the menu. Correct. Right? Correct. Um, that's where you generally need. This is the only thing that surprises me about Surkov's departure. Not that he's taken off Ukraine, but isn't there a need for Surkov now well, this is where to the, help yeah. yes. stage yes. a bit yes. of a theater? But apparently, well, I don't, we don't know. This is, I'm, I'm glad you went there, Leon, because that's exactly yeah, how I wanted to come I'm around full circle. Maybe. I'm yes. not. I am not sure. From the literally from the mouth. <laughs> <Right. and then. laughs> I am not sure the Gray Cardinal has completely left the building. Uh, rumors of his death have always been greatly exaggerated. There was um, remember after the Bologna Plosion yes. protest. You remember he that, was that on the outs. He wrote that un very uncautious tweet, right? Yes, yes. And remember, Surkov was one of those at that time arguing that Medvedev should stay president, that the system should evolve into this. And he was close to Medvedev. And yeah. he was close to Medvedev, Medvedev and that Putin should be, kind of become a national leader, supreme leader yeah. kind of a thing. He was arguing this in 2011. There the great go. irony go, is that yeah. they had listened to him <laughs> then. The regime would have been in a better place in terms of Probably. legitimacy now, Probably. but but they but they didn't listen to him then. He looked like he was on the outs, and then you remember this was such a great Goodfellas moment. I thought <laughs> he showed up on Instagram with Kadyrov. Remember that that no, photo on Instagram no, with Kadyrov, yeah. <laughs> and it was so clear to anybody that understands Russia what that was all about. That was Surkov saying, "Don't mess with me. This is my Krisha. Chechen brothers. <laughs> this Chechen guy, brothers. This, yes. this dude's yes. crazy. Yes, yes. <laughs> so and sure enough, he was back. Back in 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 the Kremlin shortly after. So, is Surkov really gone? I don't think so. I think you're right, Leon. Go ahead, Don. I was just going to make a final comment on Ukraine, which I think that uh, is a danger for Ukraine. I think that with or without Donbass, all three of us would agree it's gone. From yeah, Russia. But what's troubling is that not everybody in the Russian elite or even in the West realizes how far gone it's it's come, and I think that's a danger in making policy here. People talk about the Ukraine corruption, and there are many more corrupt Ukraines than countries, although it is corrupt. And also, may that misperception may lead the Kremlin to do things that are rash again. It may. It's not likely, but it may. And I think it's a danger for Ukraine. The people who pay attention to the country and what's going on in the ground, I think, are not numerous enough. And we have to remember that. No, and I mean, Ukraine is gone for a number of reasons. Um, and it's been something that I think has been brewing since independence. Um, I, I, I wrote a piece called Separated at Birth, Why Ukraine is Not Russia. And if you look at it, and I've, I've said this before, and I think it merits repeating, every single Ukrainian election since independence has been competitive. Yep. Every yep. single yep. one. Yep. The incumbent has only won re-election once Leonid Kuchma in 99. Yep. Yep. That was the only one. Yep. And civil society in Ukraine has been continuously gaining strength mm -hmm. since independence. So Ukraine went on a completely different political trajectory than Russia. It doesn't have a succession problem. It has its elections. <laughs> Presidents lose and they step aside. It started in 94. I'll never forget. I was in Kiev that summer, most boring election I ever I ever Kravchuk. witnessed. Yeah, when 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 Kravchuk and Kuchma, and Kravchuk lost and Kuchma like came to power. I'm like, yep. oh wow, you this is something transition. That, yep. This is something. Holy cow! <laughs> Surkov's wizard, wizardry cannot manipulate. <laughs> yeah, this. right. Yep. Surkov's wizardry yep. cannot manipulate yep. this. Yep. Um, but but so that Ukraine is gone for that reason. Right. How does Russia, and again, we're in uncharted territory in so many different ways yeah. because Russia as a state has never had to really legitimize itself without Ukraine. And it's yeah. going to, I think it's not going to have any choice but to do it. How is it going to do it? Last thoughts before we wrap it up and call and call it. We got to do We got to have Leon on more often. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I'm enjoying this thoroughly with you. Um, yeah, let's talk about Belarus maybe at some point. Um, it, let's talk. I, I'd say let's talk more about the Baltics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's the, 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 the Baltics, you know, the Shakespearean expression, um, um, 
uh, what's that? Um, uh, be all and all. Right. In other words, it's a huge risk, but man, would that be an enormous triumph? To, if a, to, you mean if it de- discredited NATO's de- de- Article precisely. Five guarantees? Precisely. And and we're not talking about you know no straw man. We're not talking about rolling tanks into Tallinn or. You're talking about salami tactics. No, basically. no. We're, we're talking about uh, a so-called Latagate, uh, mm-hmm. Daugav pills, right? Uh, and uh, and uh, you know the, the the majority of Russian territories, which is sliver, right? Um, uh, but but the the triumph would be enormous. Although I think I, I worry less about that because the Russian pop, Russian speaking populations in the Balk- Baltics have changed, and oh, they're oh, not oh, they're but, not but, down but, with but this. But Brian, that's another thing. I mean, don't start me on this. I've been thinking about this for <laughs> for years. He doesn't need the population. I mean, at the age of fake news, you, you don't right. you don't need the population. Well, this you is need, Sir Surkov need, may have a role after. Of course, him. you need you need three hundred people demonstrating and presumably shot by the Estonian police. That's all very easy to engineer. Right. I mean, if I mean wh- wh- where we're going here, it seems to me is if you need a legitimization myth, if Ukraine is going to be gone, you're going to have to have it someplace else. Um, Belarus is is a, is, a, is a certainly a candidate. Yeah. Northern Kazakhstan is a candidate after Nazarbayev Correct. dies. Only exactly after right. Nazarbayev dies. Exactly Putin right. is not going to dare no. mess with Nazarbayev because no. he's the only one in the post-Soviet space I think that Putin's afraid of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Frankly. Um, but but the Baltics, I I think that is a bridge too far even for Putin because the, the yeah the, the, you're right the payoff is enormous but the risk is enormous right. too right. and and you might be engaging. American troops sooner than you want to, well, or NATO troops sooner we, than you want to. Do we die for Danzig? I, mean, <laughs> if, you know, I doubt it. Don, last word to you before we call it a weekend. Well, I had to kind of file the uh, Russian minority in Estonia so in a more safe camp than you guys have indicated, so... I'm just going to say I'm worried now. No, it's. I mean, we we are going into uncharted yeah. territory in so many yeah. different yeah, ways. And one 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 uh, one last thing. I I you know I traveled um, to the Baltic countries this summer. Talked to several dozen people. Go to go to Daugav Pils on the 9th of May, and see mm. young men and women in uh, in the flight caps pilotki, with chanting Russia Russia Putin Putin. Whether they paid for, whether they import it, I don't know. They're doing, mm-hmm. it, They're doing it, and and you don't need many. Mm-hmm. So we're going to need some kabuki. Th- I mean, they're going to oh, need yeah. some kabuki That's theater, right. That's which right. suggests that, I mean, the last word here is that maybe the great cardinal has not really left the building, <laughs> the building. after all. And, and that is all probably we... volunteer to be on the podcast. Next uh, week. I'd love to have him on the podcast. Um, that's all we have time for today. I'd like to remind you, you have been listening to the Power Vertical Podcast, a very lively edition of the Power Vertical Pro- Podcast. My name is Brian Whitmore, director of the Russia program here at SEPA. Joining me here in the studio has been Liana Roan, a resident scholar and director of the Russian study of Russian studies at the American Enterprise Institute and somebody I am going to be bugging to come on the f- podcast much more in the by future also with us in the studio has been my perennial sidekick former US <laughs> State Department <laughs> official and veteran criminal watcher Donald Jensen a senior fellow and editor-in-chief here at SEPA and a lecturer at Johns Hopkins University thank you both for thank a you guys. fun thank enlightening you. and lively yes, discussion indeed. I'd also like to thank our producer Mikhail Harmata for keeping the lights on and all the complicated machines well oiled <laughs> and in working order throughout our discussion. I'd also like to remind you you could subscribe to the Power Vertical podcast on iTunes. You can read the Power Vertical blog and watch the vertical video at sepa.org and you can follow us on the Twitter at Power Vertical. Join us again next week. And now, as always, I leave you with something other than the ambient sounds of my favorite socially conscious Russian rapper, Noise MC. <laughs>